great orange shop sign-up sheet back there on the bulletin board. If you are able to help with that, please uh, sign up. We need people in all different positions. Um, some people leaving stations, other people just chauffeuring kids um, and from place to place and then helping at the stations. So if you have questions about that, see me as well. And singing, Send the Fire. In the book of Acts, we read, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each of them. The book of Acts, the word of the Lord. Some thoughts that we assembled this week from our Electro 365 devotion. In an upper room in Jerusalem, when disciples had gathered to wait, according to Jesus' instructions, the Spirit descends and rests on each of them, reminding me of the Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus. Eugene Peterson connects the dots. God gave us the miracle of congregation the same way he gave us the miracle of Jesus by the descent of the dove. The Holy Spirit descended into the womb of Mary in the Galilean village of Nazareth. Thirty or so years later, the same Holy Spirit descended into the collective spiritual womb of men and women, which included Mary, who had been followers of Jesus. The first conception gave us Jesus. The second conception gave us the church. Here's the church. Ordinary people, you, me, and everyone else under the sun. People filled with the Spirit of Jesus to live as Jesus in our world. Let's pray. Jesus, I confess the ways in which my imagination is shaped more by the consequences of the fall than the reality of your kingdom and the outpouring of your spirit. I ask for eyes to see and faith to believe that my spiritual experience up to this point is not all there is, but that every word of the scripture of the Lord is an invitation to experience something more. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Father, we pray. As we begin this time of worship and praise and adoration to open our ears to the preaching of your word and to open our lives to each other, we pray, come Holy Spirit, come! Send the fire, Lord! Let it burn all that is not pleasing with you in this place, in this time, O Lord, that we can live as people who are victor victorious over the power of sin and over the power of death. May your more come upon us now, O Lord, as we open up our lives to you. Come, Holy Spirit, to our mind, we receive your comfort. Come, Holy Spirit, to our heart, we receive your peace. Come, Holy Spirit, to our soul, for we receive the Father's love for us. Amen. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. You know, I sense that he's here already. When we're here this morning for our practice, we, uh, we can sense God all over this place this morning. We, uh, we have a lot of fun here this morning. We might have a little bit of change uh, after we've been all dressed up. And up. But it is so good to be together in God's house today. T-G-I-S. I say, thank God it's Sunday. Yeah. It is so good to have a day of rest and to come together and worship Him. We're going to do that this morning. First song we're going to sing is Come. Now is the time to worship.
I mentioned earlier, the energy in this place, we decided to spit, pump this on out a little bit, not changing the words, just changing the tune, changing the beat just because of the energy that we've had this morning. His eye is on the spirit. church on Sunday morning is where God changed my life. Amen. Amen. Someone else. Amen.
I am loved in his presence lately. I am soaking in his presence. And about three weeks ago, I prayed for something specific. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful this morning. Praise the Lord. Change. God is good. God's good. Amen. Goodness of the Lord. Right? All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Don't want to put anyone off. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Amen. I'm thankful for a long telephone call from Grace. Wonderful. Wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. Special. Very special. A gift. God's good. Well, I found out this week that I've got arthritis in my hip and arthritis in my knees, but praise God, I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> Hallelujah! Well, they think it might be, but God knows all my right? See, it doesn't matter about our circumstances. There's always something to praise the Lord, right? The outward's wasting away. Hallelujah. But the inward's being renewed. <laughs> I'm going up the upward way. <laughs> praise God. So, you know, we want to uh, move into our time of prayer today, and I think we're sensing today the presence of the Lord in a very powerful and real way, and this is Pentecost. This is Pentecost Sunday, and really, when we come in every Sunday, we say we're supposed to be celebrating the resurrection, but we're celebrating Pentecost every Sunday we come together because we're, we are the church. Look at someone today and say, happy birthday. 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 Happy birthday, church. Happy birthday, church. This is when we celebrate the birth of the church. And as Pastor Mike led this morning at the beginning of the service, as we had this sense last night as we were praying and praying for the service, as the sun rose today in the east and is coming around the globe, the church, the universal church of Jesus Christ, all those who know him personally, who have had their sins forgiven, have been gathering in places of worship in different languages, in different tribes, in different tongues, and they have been shouting and experience and, and, and celebrating the birthday of the church. Pentecost, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit that changes and transforms people. That a person who denied the Lord three times and thought that Christ had given up on him, Christ comes and meets with him and restores him. And on the day of Pentecost, he's a changed man. And he goes out into the streets and out in front of the people he was terrified of. And he preaches the word and 3,000 are added to the church in one day. <laughs> But he also came to a point in his life, life when he was willing to lay down his life for Christ. And Peter was crucified, tradition tells us, upside down on the cross because he wanted to see the world inverted the way that the world sees it, turned wrong. And he didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified the way that his Lord and Savior died. It was the same power of the Holy Spirit that gave him the ability to do that way. I don't know when was the last time you had the touch of the Holy Spirit, but God is here today wanting to do something new and fresh in our hearts and lives, and something new and fresh in His church. So as we move into this prayer time, as we begin to soften things down, as we begin to quiet our spirits, I pray that He is knocking at your heart's door today, and you sense Him, and you welcome Him in, that He can have fellowship with you, and you can fellowship with him today as we sing these songs. If you need to do business with God at the altar, if you need to come and stand, if you need to kneel where you're at, whatever you need to do today, you're in his house. It's his home, your home. What do you do when you go home? You kick your feet up and you relax in the presence of your family. Well, today you're in the family of God. Now don't fall asleep on us. But you're in the family of God, and you do what the Spirit is directing you to do today in His house. You are home. You are with Him. And let's just sing these songs and move in close to His heart and hear from Him and receive from Him as we then will move into our time of prayer.
As our time of prayer. Wednesday night. 
Renew our first love, Lord. That's the one thing you hold against us. And you tell us to repent and to come back and to do what we used to do when we first knew, when our eyes were first open, and we first had a passion for you and your kingdom and the things of God. Renew the passion. Fan into flame today, Holy Spirit. Oh, fire of God. May there be a fire in our bellies again. May the fire of God be in us so much that when people see us, they see Jesus. When they hear us speak, they hear Jesus. When we come along to touch and comfort, they feel Jesus. Oh, we long for the day when your church is set on fire. We heard about it, we study about it, we've heard about it in history. And God, would you not pass us by today at the Elmsdale Church of the Nazarene? We want the fire of God. It's the fire that causes others to come and to want to be attracted and to see. And Lord, we pray, oh fire, come. Come in a new and a fresh way. I never will forget how the fire fell, how the fire how the fire fell when the Lord sanctified me. Oh, do it again, Lord, we pray today. You know the needs. You know, Holy Spirit, none of us could meet the needs in this room today. No human can. But we know today, you know every person here individually, and you know their needs, and you know their heart today. And Holy Spirit, come and meet Everyone, right at that need today. Thank you for the answer to prayer. Call us like how God just answered and showed up. Lord, show up again today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you today. Director with us, 
And so in part of that, you know, we kind of broke our series, but just to do a little bit of a recap, um, we're in this, the Holy Spirit kind of directed me to this, um, you know, discouragement that seems to be around and that God wants to move the church from a place of discouragement to encouragement. And so we're looking at biblical stories of how God has done that <clears throat> and what we can learn from some of these biblical stories. And so the first one we looked at, how can we rise above discouragement? And we looked at Jeremiah and especially Jeremiah 20. And when we look at Jeremiah 20, there's a place there even after the passage we studied that he got to a place where he said, God, I wish I was never born. And I know some of us who have had suicidal tendencies and have gone through things, some that, that is a foreign thought for you. But for some people, that is a thought that they have. And, and, and we see that this is a man of God. This is a prophet of God who's discouraged. And he's doing God's work. And he's facing a discouragement. Right? So we're not saying this is an unspiritual thing when you feel discouraged. Because here is a man of God who is a prophet of God speaking the word of God to a people who don't want to hear it. And he gets discouraged. And so we said, how can you rise above discouragement? Well, you need to be honest. You need to tell God how you feel. And he can handle it. You need to be obedient. You don't stop doing what God has told you to do. If you're going through discouragement today, so that is not the time to stop doing what you know you should be doing. Because we walk by sight Right? Often, too often. We walk by feelings. Instead, we're supposed to walk by faith. And we need to be watchful. We need to look for His presence. We're waiting for God to show up. And the one thing I'm doing, I'm preaching to the choir today because you're here. You need to worship. You continue to worship. Even when you're going through those difficulties. Then we looked at Nehemiah. And we realized that uh, Israel was discouraged. The exiles were discouraged. As they returned back home to their blessed Jerusalem, and they found Jerusalem and the wall around Jerusalem in rubble. And it was worse than they had imagined. They had left and it was majestic. Now they come back after exile and it is in ruins. And what do they do? And God sent Nehemiah. Nehemiah's role was to rebuild the walls around the city, and that was to protect them. And so as they're going back, the enemy is all around them, and they came to a place where they were discouraged. And what causes discouragement? Well, one thing, fatigue. Hmm, any fishers and farmers here today feeling a little tired? Fatigue. When you are already worn out, and that should be not worn, that's new things there, worn out, worn out. <laughs> When you are worn out, that is the time when the enemy can attack and bring discouragement in, in a worse way. Frustration. <laughs> when things don't look and work the way they, we think they should, you can get very frustrated and you can become weighed down. And when fear, remember the enemies, all of their enemies were coming at them together and they're united from every direction. The enemy was coming against them and threatening that they were going to kill them. This was a real threat. And so they got worked up. And then failure. Failure often. People can speak, and those closest to us, and those even in the church, can speak failure and death instead of using their mouths to speak life. And so sometimes we need to realize that those kinds of things, some of the ones closest to us, can bring us into a place of discouragement. If we don't listen to God's voice louder than all the voices around us. Sometimes people mean good, but it's not they're not speaking for God. And we allow it to hit our hearts and we receive it when God is saying, no, 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 you don't listen to that. You listen to me. And so that was what we looked at in that. Today, we're looking at what do we do when life becomes bitter. And Pastor Mike read the right scripture for today. <laughs> That's to keep me humble. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we were looking at the reality of what does it mean to be resilient in the midst of when life can be bitter. And, uh, you know, I think, kind of weird, and you guys have figured that out. Anyone that knows me anyone at the time, I come up with the strangest things sometimes, but that's what I was thinking of this week. The Snicker commercial. Remember? Remember the sick and Betty White and the late Betty White? And, and she went around, you know, that was one of the most comical football, football, and, and that was a good commercial. Like, I still like that. I could still watch, 
I don't need the stickers, but I can still like the commercial. And, and what the commercials, if you haven't seen the premises, that you can become something that you're not when you're angry. Do you know that word, angry? I know in our family, that's my side of the family, not Pastor Mike's, my family, the newbies. You don't want to travel with them if they haven't had their meals. They get hangry. Right? And so we see today that we're seeing some people who are getting hangry because they're hungry and they're thirsty. And here's the question. How do you react? And I've had some wake-up calls on this. How do you react when you face difficult circumstances? How do you deal with disappointment and discouragement when life becomes bitter? When things don't go the way you think they should go? Today's story of Moses teaches us how the Lord provides for them and for their needs in that time, in his way, and through the people that God has put around them, although they are hungry and thirsty, hangry. You know, here's something we don't want to hear today, but it is the truth. The greatest successes of life are often followed by failure. Look at someone and say failure. Say, they've had this mountaintop experience. They have been finally set free from the tyranny of slavery. Remember? Moses is sent back. They're questioning all the plagues. They're wondering. All of a sudden, one day it changes, and they're told to set free and to leave Egypt. And not just that, they get to plunder the Egyptians. So what does plunder? Plunder tells us in the Old Testament, plunder, you plunder the nation when you won the battle. When you won the war and you were victorious, you got the plunder. And so we're told in God's word that they were so victorious, they were so set free, they got to plunder the Egyptians. And so now they're walking away, with not just set free, but they're walking away with the Egyptians' wealth. And so they're set forth and there's much singing and rejoicing and, and, and they've been set forth and they're free and we're told that all of a sudden, one of the most powerful passages for me, and I see it a lot when I pray, one of the most powerful things is all of a sudden the enemy realizes what they've done. They've just lost all of their workforce, and they've just lost all the riches have gone out into the desert. And so Pharaoh and his army comes rushing after them. Now they're terrified. They are so terrified their back is up against the sea. And they're thinking, well, we're doomed now. It's, we're done. And in that moment, God, can you just imagine, God splits the sea, and they begin to walk over on dry ground. I can't even imagine what that would be like. And it's not muddy, good old red mud, and you need your green boots. They're walking over on dry land, and then there's a lobster, and there's a fish, and they're, you know, just imagine, and the walls of water up either side of you. And you're walking, I think you walk pretty quick. And amazed, you know, it's amazing what God did. And then the enemy comes after them, but before God even splits the water, what happens is, it says that the angel of the Lord that was leading them comes behind them. And then it says, even God himself, this is what I see often in prayer, God himself comes around them. God and his angel were leading the people. When the enemy went to attack, the angel and God became their rear guard. Amen. And stood between them and the enemy. And then the waters parted. And then they went over on dry ground. And then the enemy was foolish enough to chase after them. And they drowned. The enemy was destroyed. Now there is joy in the cat. They are celebrating. We read God's word. There's tambourines. Oh, there's one here. There's tambourines going on. And there's joy in the camp. And there's excitement. And they're dancing. And they're giving God all the praise. And then we come to our passage. And they are three days in a while. Three days nursing moms have nothing to feed their babies. Three days, little ones are starting to fall apart and are crying. Now the crying doesn't even stop because they don't even have strength to cry anymore. The animals are beginning to die 
in the desert on the way. And so you can imagine, they've gone from this mountaintop experience where they have seen God move miraculously, and now all of a sudden, no water for three days. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur, and for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. I have never understood what it is like to be that thirsty. Look at me, I carry my bottle of water wherever I go. Some of you got the big, huge sippy cups and you're sipping water all the time. We love to have our water. And I've never gone that long without water. I have been in Egypt at the pyramids and looked out into the desert and I just think, unless I read this this week, I thought, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? Going around in circles and finding nothing and just getting thirstier and thirstier. Uh, this is a cute story. It was bedtime, and the father asked his son, Do you want water? The son said, No. After prayer, the father sent him to bed. Five minutes later, some of you know this, screams come from the next room. Dad! Dad! Get me a glass of water! Not even please. The dad says, No! After a minute, the boy screams again, Dad! Dad! Can you please get me a glass of water? The dad says, No, I asked you earlier if you wanted a glass of water, and you said no, and now you're in bed. It's time to go to sleep. And if you don't quiet down, I'm going to come and spank you. Now, that's not even appropriate, correct, today. After a short silence, the boy screams, Dad! Dad! When you come to speak me, can you bring a glass of water? <laughs> but we know, right? We know that water is a necessity. We know that we need water to live. Without water, we would die. And so we realized how important this was for them. And they had had this great victory, but now they're in this place. And they're like, where is God? And I know for many of us, we find ourselves in that situation. Life can be like that, but guess what they did? So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? The people grumbled. <coughs> no, never. The people murmured. The people complained. The people looked at it from upside down and around and talked about it, and they were complaining against Moses. You know who they were really complaining against? God. God. They were blaming God for their thirst. They were questioning what God was doing. And some of us, if we were to be honest today, when life is bitter for us, we can get to a place where we begin to grumble. We begin to complain. We begin to complain against God's leaders. We begin to say, God, where are you in all this? I don't understand why I'm going through these bitter times. You know, Grumbling and complaining, there was the story of a monk who joined a monastery, and the rule of the monastery was that for the first 30 years, I can't imagine this, and some of you would say, Pastor, you wouldn't survive. The first 30 years, they had to be silent without talking a single word to become a priest. However, they could talk a maximum of two words after completing every 10 years. Can you imagine? What would some of us do? After the, first, after the first 10 years, the chief priest called him and gave the monk an opportunity to speak and asked, do you have anything to say? And the monk said, food but. After another 10 years, the priest again called on the monk and said, do you have anything to speak? And the monk said, beg hard. Another 10 years went by, and at this time, it was time for the priest to anoint the monk and make him into a priest in the monastery. And he said, do you have the two words to speak? And the monk said, oh, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and then the priest said, it doesn't surprise me a bit because you've done nothing but complain ever since you got here. <laughs> See, some of us have been born talking. And if we're, <laughs> if we're grumbling or complaining, you'll know about it. But I want to tell you, you can be quiet. You can be a quiet individual who doesn't talk a whole lot. You can have an attitude of grumbling and complaining. Right? We're different personality types. You see, grumbling is nothing more than a whispered complaint. 
It's when we find fault and blame with everyone and everything. And it's an easy thing for us to fall into. It's an easy thing for us to do. And if we focus on our situations, if we only focus on our problems, we can become bitter and grumble. Now, <laughs> their situation, which happens to some of us sometimes, their situation goes from bad to worse. Now it goes from bad to worse because suddenly they, they picture water. It's not a mirage. They see a spring and the little bit of effort they have left. They run towards this water. And as they find the spring, they go to drink it. And the word of God tells us it was mara. It was bitter. And now their difficult situation gets even worse. They're going to the waters and they can't even drink it. When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. Do you remember that was uh, the name that Naomi told her people to call her? Because life had given her a bitter pill. Mara. What a disappointment. Bad enough to have no water. Now you find water and you can't drink it. I guess the question we're asking today is, has your life become bitter? Are you going through something that's bitter? Is there a situation where you thought the resolve and the answer was there and it got worse? You know, we had a conversation a while back where we said we can be bitter or we can be better. That's a choice. And there are times when we have to make the choice between complaining or thanking God for our predicaments. When the people of Israel had walked for three days without water, they chose to complain against God for their trials. And when the people discovered water at Mara, they found the water to be so bitter they couldn't drink it, and they complained even more. And now they panic, and now they're in fear. Here's a statement that I didn't even realize when I was putting it down this week, and I'm going to say it twice because it is so true. If this is all you get today, this is so true. People who are controlled by their fear, worry, and anger are not able to be led by the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Get it. People who are controlled by their fear, worry, or anger are not able to be led by the Holy Spirit. He's not able to lead you to where God wants to lead you if you are stuck in anger and complaining, if you are in fear and all you do is worry. Well, another great message. Thank you, Pastor. Expect trials to come. Expect difficulties from time to time to come. That is a part of this world we live in, but we realize that it is also a pattern of God's word. We see it often in God's word because Jericho, the walls coming down, was filled by eye. And Elijah on Mount Carmel went whining under a juniper tree. And Peter's confession that you are the Christ, when he said that to Jesus, you are the Messiah, a moment later Jesus rebukes him and says, Satan, get behind me. And Jesus, our Lord himself, after the wonderful baptism and the Holy Spirit announces, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, as he's initiated into his ministry, the first thing the Spirit, the angels and the Spirit do, is they lead him where? Into a desert. Forty days in a desert where there is no water and there is no food. I love at the end of that, it says the angels came and ministered. After the 40 days. What shall we drink? Was a question that came before them. And they also after our passage. What shall we eat? Were the forefront of the Israelites' minds. Fleshy things. They weren't seeing the bigger picture. And although they had forgotten their bondage. And beings in Egypt. All of a sudden the flesh pots in Egypt look good. And all of a sudden the water in Egypt looks good. And I meet a lot of Christians. That when they start going through difficulty and life becomes bitter. Well, I want to go back to Egypt. I want to go back to the old way. No, you don't, my friend. Right, amen. There's no answers there. You know that. You've been there. Been there, done that. No thanks. Amen. Not going back. We're told that God was testing them. Now, James has this whole dialogue in, in, in his book that talks about the difference between God's testing and the enemy's tempting. We don't have time today for that. They didn't know God 
They didn't know their own hearts. And the Lord was testing them to encourage spiritual growth. And God will test us and allow us to go through times of testing that he can bring up the best in us, that we can grow and we can mature. The devil will tempt us and he will try to bring up the worst in us and he will encourage us to throw in the towel and to give up on our faith. And so those times will come. God wants to use it as a time of testing to refine you and make you stronger. The enemy wants to take you out. How you see what's happening and your attitude and how you respond is what's going to make the difference. If we trust God and obey his word, we'll pass the test and grow. What, what is happening here is showing that if they don't pass the test, they're no different than the Egyptians. They're no different than the Egyptians. And what happened in Egypt when people wouldn't turn to God, when they wouldn't come to God and repent... And so, the water is bitter, but in this moment, we realize these people become bitter. Ever been around believers that are bitter? Not a pretty picture. Doesn't do a lot for God in his kingdom. It actually drives people further away when you meet believers who are bitter. I'm not saying believers who are going through a bitter circumstance. Did you hear me? Because we all go through bitter waters. What I'm saying is, they now have become bitter. Did you ever hear a preacher preach that's bitter? You don't like to be around that word very long. And so we need to ask if the Holy Spirit is allowing us sometimes, if we are going through difficulties, that he's wanting uh, to do a deeper work in us. He's wanting to make us stronger. But here is the big just position here. Moses took the problem where? the Lord. Moses didn't become part of the complaining crew. God helped him if he did. Moses, the leader, decided that he wasn't going to grumble and complain. What he was going to do was he was going to pray. He was going to cry out to the Lord. And oh my friends, you have a choice today to be part of that group in the church of Jesus Christ that gossips, crumbles, complains, everything is wrong, nothing is right, or you have a choice to be the people who are going to call on the Lord and look for a remedy and a solution. Amen. Moses calls out to God, and he tells him about what's going on, and he took the bitterness of his life and the difficult situation to God. And I want to tell you today, if you're going through difficulty, the best thing you can do instead of complaining and talking about it, now there is a time for brothers and sisters in Christ to hear us out. But there comes a point where we need to say, enough of that. Let's get on our knees and pray. Right. Let's take it to him. I can't solve your problems, but he can. And so Moses did what the people neglected to do. He prayed. It says in verse 25, So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Moses didn't join the complaining group. Moses did the only thing he knew to do, and that was to pray. And then God showed them the solution. And God showed him a tree. If you will cry to the Lord, Someone said, he will show you a way to make those bitter waters sweet. He can bring some sweetness out of the bitterness. He can turn things around for good. If you will cry to the Lord, it might even be right underneath your eyes. It might even, it doesn't say that God said to Moses, throw in the tree. It says God showed him the tree. Moses realized and he threw it in. And it was the solution, the remedy that they needed. There are some of us who are in dire straits. There are some of us who are backs are against the wall in certain situations. There are some of us who have been praying decades for our family. And we've been praying and praying and praying. Our back, and we're just, we feel sometimes it's so easy just to give up. It's so easy just to throw in the towel. And God is saying to you, no, you just look. You continue to pray, and I will show you the remedy. I will show you the solution. I will show you what to say and where to go and what to do. If you will what? Trust me. That's what the test was. Did they trust him? 
As soon as the prayer went up, the remedy came down. God has a remedy today, my friends, for your troubles. He has a remedy even before you went through the problem. He's waiting for you to ask. He's waiting for you to cry out. He's waiting for you to spend some time in prayer. You know what God's word says? You have not because you ask not. Why does God lead us to Mara? Why does God lead us to Mara? Well, he leads us to Mara because he wants to prove us. He wants to test us. He wants to strengthen us. I think a good way to look at it would be refine us. He, he wants to refine us. He, he wants to get us to a place. You have to realize that, that it's not in the Red Seas and it's not in the miraculous moments and it's not the mountaintops where we are tested. It is in those moments, our lowest moments, that we are tested. Disappointments and discouragements. And then he wants to purify us. He wants us to have a deeper devotion for him. And not to put our trust in men and all these things out there, but to put our trust deeper and deeper into him. He wants to humble us. God cannot move where there is pride Amen. and self-sufficiency. God wants to prepare us. He knows that we've got battles ahead of us. We've got places we need to go and things we need to do and things we need to face. And so he wants to strengthen us now to get us ready for that. That we can remain standing. That we can finish well. That we can fight the good fight. That we can stay on the narrow path. And so God will allow us sometimes as believers, as people of God, to face those bitter waters. So that we can come forth stronger and better for it. You know that beautiful thing that Pastor Mike had to sing is in this passage. This is the first place where Jehovah Rapha is mentioned. And so God is trying to teach his people who didn't know him, who didn't have a relationship with him, who thought well, this was all strange to them, that God is trying to bring them to a place where they will understand, I'm him, I'm your healer, I'm the one I want you to come to, I'm the one that's here for you no matter what. They didn't know that yet. And so in this moment, God says to them, I am your healer. If you will obey me, if you will come to me, if you will follow me, if you will take my ways, you will come to a place where I will bless you and you will not experience the diseases that the Egyptians have experienced. Because I'm your healer. I'm your Jehovah Rapha. See, ultimately, sometimes people have been raised in the church and we thought the rules were people being legalistic and the do's and the don'ts. And even today, as we talk to young people, and some people not so young, when we say you shouldn't be doing that, you don't want to be going there, you really don't want to be meddling in that. Why? Because there's a better way, my friends. It's a better way. There's a highway there. And it's the way called holiness. And we can live a life, like I said, I'm free. We sang it today. I'm free, hallelujah. I don't need any of that anymore. I don't want to be around it anymore. I'm free. Because God knows what's best for me. And he knows what's best for you. And I pray you learn it at a young age. Because some of us are paying the consequences for not listening and not paying attention. Well, we should have. It's not that God wants to make your life miserable. He wants to give you the best that he can give you. If you will obey him, if you will follow him with your whole heart, if you will seek him. You know what's good news today? Say to somebody, good news. Well, one thing that's good news, isn't it wonderful that God pointed out to him a tree? Oh, my friends, there's a tree that the Holy Spirit points out to us repeatedly. The cross. That is where my freedom has been found. Where I am set free and my sins have been paid for. But you know what's beautiful? Right after Mara, God brought them to Eden, an oasis in the middle of the desert. God knew where it was. Do you realize that Elam was only seven miles away from Marah? Seven miles. 
Now I know when I walk into so from the house huh? to O'Leary. To but I know if I walked into Alberton and back, that was 12 kilometers. So there you go. So I was able to do that in an afternoon. Hardly any fun. The arthritis and the birds sit there. That's just do something. <clears throat> so you think about it, seven miles. That's how close Elam was. Do you think God knew that Elam was there? God knew Elam was there all along. They didn't. It was so close. It was a place of blessing. It was a place of refreshment. It was a place, we're told, where there were 70 palm trees and 12 springs of water. 70 is that word for complete that it was a complete, perfect place for them, and 12 tribes had 12 springs of water for themselves, so they had all the water they could ever need. It was the place that God had for them. See, they had never known God. They had never experienced God. They, this was all new to them. And in this moment, when they're learning their lessons, God is now wanting to bring them to a place of rest and a place of worship, a place where they could spend time with Him. A spa in the middle of the desert. That's what God had for them. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. You know, the actual word here for healer is also translated doctor. God wanted to be their doctor. And God knew what they needed more than they did. And he brought them to a place of treatment and therapy and refreshment and worship. And so, my friends, today, we realize that God wants to do something for us. If you're going through bitter times, if you're going through difficulties, did you realize that the, what God has for you might be just around the corner? Just around the corner, the next corner. How did they get to Elam? Well, they kept going. They kept following. They kept trusting. They kept obeying. They kept praying. They kept doing whatever God told them to do. And just for you the same, I want to tell you today, if you're discouraged, if you're going through bitter days, if there's things that are going on in your life, you cannot quit because Elam is just around the next rise. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. Has life become bitter for you? Even true believers will have seasons of sharp trial. We'll be tempted to fret and distress and murmur and complain. But in every trial, we are to cast our care upon the Lord and pour out our hearts before Him. Moses did what the people neglected to do, pray. He called upon the Lord, and the moment he called behind, upon the Lord, the solution was there, exactly what they needed. The tree branch, some believe it was moringa tree, there's other trees, but actually was thrown into the water and the bitter waters were made sweet. You know, he can do the same for us today. If we'll ask him, if we'll trust him, he can turn the bitter pills of life into sweet memories and moments where God showed up. Amen. And we were never the same again. Well, closing illustration. China Cup. Imagine... I, I didn't bring two pieces because I probably would break it. Imagine, that's why I left it there today. Imagine a beautiful china cup. It wasn't always like this. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, God understood. There was a time when it was a cold, hard lump of clay. One day the potter picked me up, the cup would say, and said, I could do something with this. Then he started to put pressure on me and change my shape. I said, what are you doing? That hurts. Stop. But he said, not yet. Then he put me on a wheel and began to spin me around and around and around. And I shouted, let me off. And he replied, mm, not yet. Then he shaped me into a cup and put me in a hot oven. <laughs> I cried, Lord, let me out of here. I am suffocating. But he looked at me and said, mm, not yet. When he took me out, and I thought the work was finally over, and I said, finally. But then he started to paint me. 
I couldn't believe what he did next. He put me in another fire again. And I said, I can't stand this anymore, Lord. Please let me out. But he said, hmm, not yet. And finally, he took me out of the oven and he put me up on a shelf and held me there. And, and I thought, left me there. And I thought, well, he's forgotten me. You know, I think of the Apostle Paul off in Tarsus for, what, 10 years, they believe, before Barnabas came looking for him. He was left up on a shelf, forgotten then one day he came for me. He took me off that shelf and he held me up before a mirror and I could see. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had become something beautiful, something of value, something that everyone would want to buy and drink from. Are there things going on in your life right now that you don't understand? And you would say, Lord, stop your prayers. I I can't take it anymore. And God is saying to you today, hmm, not yet. I'm not finished with you yet. There's still much ahead, but I am with you. I am the Father. You are the clay. Trust Him that when you finally arrive to the place He wants you to be, you will realize that He is the making you His vessel to be filled with His Holy Spirit something of beauty to be used for his glory and not your own. That he wants to bless you today in order to use you to be a blessing to others. You have a choice to either grumble and complain or to cry to God and pray and ask for the solution to get you through today and tomorrow and next week until he comes through and shows you exactly what it's all about. Some of us might not go back to glory but do I trust him enough that he knows what he's doing? Do I trust him enough to know he's a good God? That I can obey him and he wants the best for me? And he is indeed my healer. My Jehovah Rapha. Your healer. Let's stand. Let's pray. And we'll close this service. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for these stories in your word that often we just glanced over. And yet there's so much there. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're not done with any of us in this room today. You are wanting to shape us and work on us and do that work that only you can do. And God, we confess, we don't like the fire. <laughs> we don't like being shaped. We don't like when you cut the corners off. We don't like, Lord, when you're working in our hearts and lives to make us stronger and better than we've ever been. But we do admit today that I would sooner be a vessel of the Lord filled with the Spirit than a lump of clay left in the, in the streets. So God, we surrender to you today, O oh great divine Father, and we are the clay. Help us to learn the better way. Help us to walk the King's highway. Help us to be people of prayer and not just rumble and complaining. Help us never to be bitter people. Oh, we go through bitterness and bitter in life. But we don't need to be better. We can rise above it and be better. And so God, do that work today that only you can do in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. I'm going to sing the song, Breakthrough. And if you're needing to break through today, the Holy Spirit to break through, you know, I encourage you to come. And we'd love to pray with you. That God wants to give you that breakthrough. But until he does, like I would love to say it's magic. You come forward and it all falls into place. Sometimes it does, hallelujah. Other times it doesn't. But until he does, he can give you the strength that's needed to face whatever you're going through and whatever you're facing. Let's sing this song together.
crying out to him. You know, choose to cry out to him and look to him for the answer instead of just grumbling and complaining. Right? Grumbling and complaining will get us nowhere. It's so much better when we choose to reach out, to cry out to him and ask for a solution. Lord, you've seen those hands raised today. You've seen those needs that are there. May your Elam just be around the corner. May the answer be there. May the breakthrough come. You've been waiting for them to cry out to you, to ask and to seek and to pray. And Lord, we trust you today that you can move us from discouragement to encouragement, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now listen to the benediction. Philippians 2, 13 to 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure people of God without fault. The word of the Lord. Go. God bless you.